The Born Harbor Cycle. I'm sure you're asking yourself, what is a Born Harbor Cycle? Well, the Born Harbor Cycle is actually named after two German scientists, uh, Max Born and Fritz Haber. This is a process that helped them determine ionization energy for ionic compounds. Because ionization energy could not be determined experimentally, it was actually determined indirectly. So here's what they did. There are several important concepts that are going to be applied to the born haber cycle, and we're going to go through all these. First, there's sublimation energy. Second, there's ionization energy. Third, there's dissociation energy. Fourth, there's electron affinity. Of course, there's energy associated with that. Next, there's a lattice energy of an ionic solid. And then also, we're going to use all these to get the heat of formation of the ionic compound. And then also, we're going to use Hess's law to do that. So let's get started. The energy change associated, we're going to look at an example of an ionic compound. We're going to use lithium fluoride. And we're going to look at when it's formed from its elements. Mm -hmm. What happens is we're going to look at lithium ions in the gaseous state plus fluoride ions in the gaseous state form lithium fluoride solid. Now, that's the definition of ionization energy. So energy is a state function. That means it only matters where you begin and you start. It doesn't matter about any of the points in between. And this reaction is going to be broken down into a series of steps. And the sum of these steps will give the overall energy of the reaction. So let's get started. So first we have sublimation energy. So hopefully you remember what to sublime means. Now what actually is going to sublime here is a solid lithium. So it's the energy that, that is required to make lithium go from the solid state to the gaseous. And, and, and when something sublimes, remember, it completely bypasses a liquid phase. It goes straight from solid to gas. Now, when the amount of energy that was required for a mole of lith lithium to turn into a mole of lithium gas from solid is 161 kilojoules. Now, notice I wrote that on the left-hand side. Lithium is written here on the left hand. Lithium is written here on the left hand side. Anytime something is written on the left hand side or energy is written on the left hand side, that means it is endothermic. Notice that it is a positive delta H. That means energy was put into this. So energy was put in to go from the solid to the gaseous state. So next, number two, ionization energy. So what is going to be ionized is once again the solid lithium. Lithium has an electron in the it's an SM1 orbital and it's an energy energy that's required to remove an electron from the neutral atom or it could be an, an ion for other types of ionization energy. Now specifically for this it's going to be 520 kilojoules is going to be added to a mole of lithium in the gaseous state to produce lithium ion in the gaseous state and you're also going to get a mole of electrons in the process. Notice that energy once again is a reactant that means energy is going to be put into this process and so there's, the amount of energy is a positive 520 kilojoules per mole. Now that's ionization energy. So number two, let's do number three. Number three, number three, you may recall is dissociation energy. Now what's going to be dissociated? Now we're going to go from, the, we've been looking at the metal, now we're going to actually look at the non-metal, the diatomic fluorine gas. So fluorine is going to be dissociated from fluorine molecules into single fluorine atoms. And we need a mole of fluorine so we're going to actually start with a half a mole of, the, of diatomic fluorine. So when we separate a half a mole of diatomic fluorine, we'll get one mole of fluorine. So the amount of energy that is required to do that is 77 kilojoules. Notice, once again, the energy is a reactant. That means it is an endothermic process. We use a half a mole of diatomic fluorine, produce one mole of fluorine as a gas. This is, once again, we said endothermic, it's a positive delta H, and it's positive 77 kilojoules per mole, and there is energy that is put into this process. Now, the magnitude of the dissociation energy depends on the electronegativity of the atoms that are involved in that process. So that's number three. Let's do number four. Number four is electron affinity. Remember, when you form an ion compound, it's formed from the ions, and so far, fluorine is not an ion, so we're adding electrons to the fluorine, the formation of fluorine ions from the, the fluorine atoms in the gaseous state. So it's the energy required when the electrons are added to that neutral atom, or if it's, it could also be an ion. So in our case, it's going to be fluorine plus the electron is going to give you fluoride ions and this time, energy is written on the right-hand side. That means energy is released. It's an exothermic process. 
the delta H for this is a negative 328 kilojoules per mole. And once again, we're saying energy is released. So that's electron affinity. That's number four. Last one, number five. Number five is a big one. Number five is a big one. That is lattice energy. Remember, lattice energy, you're going to form solid lithium fluoride from its gaseous ions. The gaseous lithium ions, which we've now formed through ionization energy and sublimation, and the, and the gaseous fluoride ions, which we form from dissociation energy and electron affinity. And it's that energy change that occurs when these separated gaseous ions come together and form that ionic solid. Now, the general format for that is M, and hopefully you know what M represents. M represents metal. So the positive metal, remember metals are always positive, combines with a non-metal, which is a negative, and you form that ionic solid, and then there's tremendous amounts of energy released. In our, in our example, we're going to look at lithium ion gaseous state plus fluoride ion gaseous state forms solid lithium fluoride, and the huge amount of energy that's released with this is 1,047 kilojoules per mole. So once again, this is an exothermic process, process negative delta H. And this is interesting because we think, you know, what is the, the likelihood or why would this be spontaneous? Remember, a negative delta G is spontaneous. And actually, we're decreasing entropy a lot here because we're going from gaseous ions of two different types to this very rigid one type of a solid. So the delta S for this is actually negative, and it's much, much lower entropy. So why would this occur? Remember, delta H, a negative delta H promotes a negative delta G, and this is a huge delta H. It's very exothermic. So this is a part that makes or promotes this being spontaneous. The fact that we have a negative delta H here, even though there is a negative delta S, this, this negative delta H is very large, and so it contributes to there being a negative delta G and for this process being spontaneous. A, a characteristic of ionic compounds is they, they're very strong. You know, what would be a demonstration of that? The fact that they have very high melting points, very high boiling points. Those very high melting and boiling points give us an idea of the strength and the stability of ionic solids. The higher the melting or the boiling points, the stronger and more stable the ionic solid. Now, some ionic solids are so, uh, so strong and they require such high temperatures that when they are heated to those high temperatures, actually they simply decompose and they actually don't ever melt or even boil. And so the last thing we'll look at is called the heat of formation. And this is what you're familiar with when we take just a small of a solid, that's the standard state of the solid sodium, and a half a mole of the diatomic chlorine gas. And we get a mole of sodium chloride. Now, remember, we're talking lithium chloride, so, but it's the same process. And it's an energy change that occurs when you're forming a mole of a compound from its elements in their standard states. And this can be positive or negative, depends on what you're forming and how they interact. In this case, of course, uh, this is going to be negative. Let's look, how does all this work? Well, let's look at Hess's Law. Now, Hess's Law basically states if you can combine the individual reactions you can add those energies, you're going to get the overall energy change. And that's what we're doing here. And the Born-Haber cycle is really Hess's law applied to an ionic solid. So let's look at how that occurs. So we really have one, two, three, four, five different processes here. First, we have the first process. This is sublimation of lithium. So the first one is sublimation. The second one, remember, is the ionization energy. We remove that electron. The third one is dissociation energy. And all those are endothermic. Then next we have the exothermic process, the electron affinity, and then we have the ionization energy. Now notice we can combine these energy changes if we can combine the overall steps. Now let's convince ourselves we can do that. So let's say go over and cross things out. So we can cross out the lithium gas. We can cross out a mole of electrons. We can cross out the fluoride gas. We can cross out the fluoride ion. There's that gone. And what else do we have to cross out here? We have um, the lithium ion to cross out as well. Lithium ion to cross out. So if we look at what's left, we basically have the lithium solid plus one half a mole of lithium gas gives us the lithium fluoride solid. And that's the overall reaction. And thus, that would be the overall change, the negative um, energy change, the exothermic process for the formation 
of that compound from its elements in their standard state. So that would be using Hess's law. So next thing we're going to do is look at this chart. Now this is a great chart that shows us these energy changes in a diagrammatic format. Now notice we have the first one. This is the sublimation because we're going from solid lithium to gaseous lithium, and that's 161 kilojoules. Next, we're going from gaseous, gaseous lithium to gaseous li lithium ion. So that would be ionization energy. That's number two is ionization energy, and that's still endothermic. The third endothermic process is dissociation energy. Now, no notice we have diatomic fluorine, diatomic fluorine, and diatomic fluorine. But going from this and the third st step, we go from diatomic fluorine to monatomic fluorine. So we have a ha half a mole, and now we have an entire mole of monatomic fluorine. And then the next process would be electron affinity because this fluoride atom does not have, have an ion, so it adds an electron. And so there we have a fluoride ion. And then we combine these two ions in their gaseous state to form the lithium fluoride solid. This fifth energy would be the lattice energy. And then when you combine all those, the overall change would be the delta H a formation of this lithium solid from its elements in their standard state, which is a negative 161 kilojoules. Last, instead, so that's a Born-Hopper cycle. Last, let's look at ionic solids. This is lithium fluoride. This is what the crystal actually looks like. So notice here, if you look at, for example, a this is a fluoride, this is a fluoride atom right here. So how many different lithium atoms are around it? Well, a lithium atom or ion is surrounded by six fluoride ions. So you could count one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. And actually, the fluoride ions are surrounded by six lithium ions. And this is going to be true for any binary ionic compound that's formed by an alkali metal and a halogen. So this is a very stable, very strong structure. Oh, God. I've got very bad news. That's it. That's all I have to say about the born Haber cycle. We're going to have to stop right here. Um, you know, this has been a lot of fun, but I'll see you in class tomorrow. Have a great night.